fun. I thought you guys would like this uh, little presentation here about networking. It's good. It's pertinent for every one of y'all because this is kind of the day that we do electrical stuff and all that. But this is a little axiom I wanted to put on you. When you're supposed to be working, it's not good to be wasting time. So but how would you define wasting time? Give, tell me something that you would consider time wasting. Party in the night before you have to go to work and you have a hangover the next day. That's right, but what about while you're at work? Yes. What about what about what you're at while you're at work? What would you consider time wasting? It's not wasting time if you're enjoying Well, I mean Really? Yeah. Seriously? I mean, you're, what you're saying is, you, you know, whenever you're at work and you're you're uh, pr cooling in the, in the break room with your feet propped up all morning long, you're you're enjoying that. But are you wasting time or are you you're not, not being productive? In other words, you can right. get the broom out. You get the this is what's wasting time. <laughs> this is time wasting, and that's what that's what he's doing right now. You know, he's got to be playing the golf and all this kind of stuff. That's time wasting. Over here we have a scan tool. Not only is he wasting his time, he's wasting the other guy's time because the other guy is taking his attention off the scan tool so he can watch him play whatever that little game is where the old man's running around the green field. <laughs> All right, let's look at fiddling with networks here. We're going to do a quick look at networks. About these abbreviations, we've talked about different abbreviations. I've been researching this for an article I wrote back in 2005. ACP is audio control protocol. That's basically whenever your audio system's talking to its very different components. Controller area network is one of the faster buses that has come out over the last 10 years or so. There's slow, slow CAN buses and fast CAN buses. They range from, you know, like a half, you know, like 500 kilobits per second to like 80 something kilobits per second up and down. Uh, CAN bus is just basically is this with bus on the end of it. Candy is for automotive network controller area network diagnostic interface. That's a Chevrolet thing. That's an old GM thing. Candy is also the abbreviation for CIRT Appliance and Network and Defense Initiative, which has nothing to do with automotive. But they love, seems like a lot of these have, they, they love to use particular little uh, words. Uh, and it's not an acronym unless it spells a word. So I guess candy spells a word. CC2 or uh, CCD or C2D is Chrysler Collision Detection, which has nothing to do with collisions, but all about sorting out messages as they're exchanged between controllers on the Chrysler network. Then you got your ISO, which is the International, International Standards Organization. You also got SAE, which I didn't want to put on this list. I mean, I left it off with a bunch of different SAE classifications for network. Local Interconnect Network. BCI is Programmable Communications Interface, which stands for peri Peripheral Communication. Uh, component interface and non-automotive applications. So they use PCI a couple of different ways, but in a, in a vehicle, particularly Chrysler likes to use PCI. Serial communication interface stands for scalable, scalable coherent interface and non-automotive automotive applications. Then you got your SCP, this is for your UART, uh, which is universal asynchronous for installed most media-oriented systems transport, which is kind of like this. And then JASPAR, which would be your Japan Automotive Software Program Architecture. FlexRay is a big deal that's kind of coming up, and they're, they're going to make it, you know, where you can talk to all these others. I'm in, I'm in class right now. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to do it right now. I'm in class. Okay. So, usually until about 4. Yeah, come back at 1 and see me. Okay. All right. All right. All networks are not the same. Faster can and similar networks are used for powertrain control and vehicle dynamics. The faster networks are used for stuff where decisions need to be made in nanoseconds. So you're not going to put no slow network dealing with your throttle control or any of that kind of thing. There's high and low speed CAN buses measured in megabits per second. A byte is eight bits. Each one of these is like an on off switch. If it's zero, it's off. If it's one, it's on. And when it turns various different ones off and on, I've actually got a little worksheet that I give you that you're going to probably see in a, I'm going to give it to you today, where you're basically figuring binary code. Where you're, This is going to be, this starts out counting, you know, 128, then 64, and then 32, and it goes all the way down to 1. And what, you, what you're going to do is, the ones that are on 1, you're going to add those up, and that's going to give you the value of that word. Or that byte, rather, and then you bytes from form two bytes equals a word, you know, so on and so forth. And so a byte is eight of these bits. This is not anything you really have to know. Human DNA is a digital code, most of which has never been decrypted, by the way. Now, slower networks are used for less mission critical functions. 
like audio, GPS, that kind of thing, but electronics on near future vehicles. How many of you guys know of a late model vehicle that whenever you pull it into the garage, it wants to connect to your Wi-Fi in your house? A lot of the, lot of the new ones are like that. Or sometimes they'll want to connect to other vehicles and stuff like that. So, all right, so we had buses in and out. Different vehicle manufacturers tend to give their network different names, but these are the basic categories. You got your LIN, which was SAEJ2602, low speed single master multi slave serial networking protocol. Protocol is a language. <coughs> the LIN master node typically connects the LIN network with higher level network. So basically, what you're going to have is you're going to have a a low speed network and a high speed network or more than one network that are all connected through one box that can talk to all of them. See what I mean? That's kind of how that works. Maximum speed 20 kilobits per second. Now that's not kilobytes per second, it's kilobits per second, okay? If you say kilobytes, you're multiplying it by a factor of eight. So make sure whenever you're saying that you'll be kilobits, not kilobytes. Applications would be door locks, climate control, seat belts, sunroof, lighting, window lift, motor, mirror control. That stuff doesn't have to happen all that fast, does it? All right, then you got your CAN, which is your multi-master, and an asynchronous. Each one of these boxes is a smart box that can do all kinds of things on its own. Like for example, on the uh, the 6.4 liter Power Stroke, there's a little CAN bus uh, that operates between the fuel injector control module and the PCM, and there's also a little uh, turbocharger control up there. And so if the PCM asks the turbocharger control unit to give it more boost, the turbocharger control unit is subject to say, I'm not giving you anything until you turn on that coolant pump and give me some coolant up here because I'm hot. So you can, it can actually refuse a command because it's thinking it on its own. Maximum speed, what is that? Somebody tell me what that is. I guess Zane's trying to find it on Google. What you got? One megabit per second. Application, body system, engine management, and transmission. See, this is fast enough to do your engine management. Then you got your flex ray, which is the next generation deterministic fault tolerance <coughs> network protocol that enables high bandwidth safety critical, critical applications. 10 megabits per second, 10 times as fast as plain old CAN, right? Uh, drive by wire, brake by wire, advanced safety and collision avoidance system, steer by wire, stability control, camera based monitoring system, all that stuff. All right, radio frequency transmission. Uh, have you used that before? Anybody use that? Radio frequency Yeah. Anybody use that before? Anybody in here use RF? Have you ever punched the button on a keyless fob? Have you ever dealt with the tire pressure monitor system like on the Chevys, what you got to do before you're going to set those up? You got to mash both buttons until it goes honk honk. And then you go to your left front wheel, your right front wheel. See, the receiver on that is basically radio frequency. Since it's already using radio frequency, they just gave it another job to talk to the tire pressure sensor on that one. Now, on this GM schematic, this is a symbol used for a bus connection. You see that symbol right there where it's talking back and forth? There's a little place you can tell that this right here, this line is a network line. So you're showing your BCM and your instrument panel cluster talking to whatever else is on that line. Learn the symbols for the vehicle you're working on. They're not all the same. You can figure them out if you're thinking out of your, if you're not playing with your phone all the time. Okay, 2010 Mazda Tribute Network. This schematic is fairly friendly. It even shows you the pinout of the data link connector. That's pretty handy, isn't it? All right, what is this down here? What's that on the bottom? That's ground, isn't it? Now, the way these Mazdas are set up, sometimes they'll have a picture of the car down here, a little picture of a car body, and that's showing you that it's grounded to the car body. Now, uh, this one right here is showing the battery connected to that and everything. That's like a ground rail. All right, so basically you've got this little, you got this uh, CAN network here that's talking on 11 and 3. Your, here's your power going into your pin 16. Ground goes to 4 and 5. You notice how 16 is on the narrow side of that, and if this was flipped over, 16 is always on the bottom right, and these two are always in the middle on the top. That's the same on every data link connector. You're always going to see this one here, if you're looking at it from this angle with the wide part up, 16 and 4 and 5 is going to be ground. All right. And this, as you go on over here to this can, like over here next door, it's showing you where all it's going to. Audio unit, front display interface, smart junction box, front control interface, satellite radio receiver, 
manual climate control instrument cluster. All of that stuff is on the bus. Everybody is talking on that same two wires. Now in your 2003 Toyota Avalon DLC, some schematics takes them getting used to. Look at this data link connector right here. Now you might notice that that's ground and that's power, but they're really not too friendly. These Toyota folks, sometimes if you look at those, some of the Toyota stuff's not friendly at all. I'm going to tell you a little brief story here. We had a 07 Avalon in here that belonged to uh, one of the maintenance men. And when we got through working on it, you know, we had the battery cable off and we did some work on it and all that kind of thing. And I don't know, we, I can't remember if we did something to the, whatever happened, uh, when we got it back, he says, my power sunroof doesn't work anymore. And whatever we did was, I think, mostly under the hood. We were scratching our heads about that. So we had to go to Identifix and look that up. Before the sunroof will work, you have to reprogram all the windows so they'll know where up and down is. So basically, after we did the programming procedure on all four windows, then the sunroof came back online. And see, they did that that way to make you get those windows programmed because it wants to count those commutators and see where, where the bottom and the top is on those motors. That's what these things do. They're kept, they want to know where, you know where each position is. On the 2005 Jeep Grand Cherokee, if you know the DLC pin assignments, it gives you something of a leg up. See, this is your data link connector right here. So you got your fuse, then you basically got your can C, and basically down here you got this other stuff you're going, your powertrain control module's got some stuff going to it on here, your SCI receive, and your SCI, you got two receives, and you got uh, one transmit. Uh, well, actually, you got two transmits and two receives, so you got a sort of a double bus going on there. Then you got your transmission control module that's tied into just one of those. See? All right, then you got your down here's your ground. That's pins four and five. That's pin sixteen. See, it kind of is. You can begin to see the pattern developing here, and that's kind of what you're looking at right here. This is a the way Chrysler lays theirs out. Now I put the colors in there. Chrysler doesn't give you colors on that. I did. Now Chrysler's pre-cam buses, the old PCI bus circuit hang around for a long time. It was a one-wire, not a fault-tolerant circuit. If anything died on this, if it shorted the ground or whatever, it would just kill the whole circuit. Uh, CCB bus circuit was, a, you know, you got a twisted pair. If you don't have enough twists in your wires, you're going to have issues. So you got to have so many twists, you know, per inch or whatever. All right, the, the wire color for the PCI, yeah, you know, he's talking about that. And this right here is a sort of a graphic uh, telling you what the difference between a one and a zero is. You see that right there? So basically, you got beginning and end uh, here, and then this right here as it goes up and down, that's your one and zero. You notice how that one there turns out to be a zero even though it's up? And that one there because it's the length of it apparently. Now this is a low high voltage signal, it's a pulse width variability thing. All right. Now you notice the data link connector on this one is included because the data link connector provides a connection point for your scan tool. You plug your scan tool in, your scan tool becomes a part of the network. One of the things that I thought was very interesting was whenever we were at uh, Craig Van Battenberg School up there, I was up there in 2010, he had somebody to build him some splitters, which would be like he would have one connector to plug into the scan tool, I mean the data link under the dash, and he split it out to two with the idea that we might be able to plug in two scan tools at once. I bet nobody else has ever done anything like that. But we were trying it. This was, He had three of those things built. I don't know what he paid to have them built. But we would plug those in, and this guy would plug in his scan tool, and he would be talking. And when I plugged my scan tool into the other side of that splitter, it would kick his scan tool off. And he would lose communication. And then I would, I would be, So basically, you can't communicate. You've got to have, you know, it stands to reason, you can't just take a network cable and put it in a, you know, put a T in it and stick it to two computers, can you? That don't work. you got to have a switch. What? Why do you want to do that? Because he was teaching and he wanted other people to compare, like, see what two scan tools were reading on the same car at the same time. You can see why he'd want to do it. Now, if you're doing it in a shop, you probably wouldn't want to do it. But in a teaching situation, he was just going to give it a crack. But you basically have to have sort to sort, something to sort those packets out. Because, you know, one scan tool would always kick the other one off. The second one that tried to log in would typically kick the first one off. And uh, that's a little something that's, uh, that I don't know if anybody else has even tried to do. But I know those things that he had built pretty much without being worthless. All right, unless you wanted to go back and forth from scan tool to scan tool or something. Now this one right here has got a diagnostic junction port connector. It's another Grand Cherokee thing. All right, so you see all these modules. 
are hooked together at this connector. This is basically a bus bar. Now Chevrolet does this. It's really a good thing. Uh, and basically, but on Jeeps, these went away. Sometimes you'll have a bunch of, I mean, one module that is in the middle hooking up to all these different modules. So you can track down, see about this, see this network and that network, and you got all these other networks. These are each got their own discrete hookup, and that network right there is a different network than that one. And then you got this one here, so on and so forth. But not all of them use the module with the bus with the same intensity. Your PCM, TCM, and BCM are the ones doing the most talking. All right, so the simple early neon ones was just a data link connector, remote keyless entry, PCM, a airbag. This basically did that. But not all of the bus-related trouble codes indicated a bus failure. Now, they can result from things like disconnecting a module with a key on or anything else that might cause a module to stop communicating. Remember the Cadillac I told you about that had high fuel pressure that was causing the traction control to come on? What code was it throwing? A network code. See what I mean? So you're getting a network code for that reason. All right, now then, one good way of following up on symptoms of a bus failure is to check the response of each module on your scan tool screen. If a module is present on the car but doesn't respond, you may have a partial bus failure. Now, you got to know that it's on the car. If you're going in here looking for ABS and ABS doesn't show up and it ain't got ABS, you're not going to get any communication with something that's not there. So be aware of that. This right here was from the old DRB3. It'll tell you which modules are present. All of these are present, you know, and so on and so forth. One wire buses fail if the bus is shorted to ground anywhere. Uh, on some of the, uh, like on the Mercedes, some of those German cars, they have actually got a bus that works in a circle. And each one of the actuators under the dash for the air conditioner is wired in series so that if you cut the bus on one side or another or in between two of them, it still talks the other, through the other wire, which is pretty neat stuff. You know. All right. So... Two wire buses that are fault tolerant and some aren't will still talk if one of the two wires is compromised. Like sometimes if you lose one wire, you'll still be able to talk. All right, this is, they got a lot of buses on these cars nowadays. Uh, the bus speeds vary from, you know, whatever it needs to be done. You got CAN, GPS, GSM, LAN, most, and all that kind of stuff. I just flashed that up there just to give you an idea of, you know, what the average car has got right there. Now, sometimes you might encounter a situation where you can't communicate with the PCM in enhanced mode, but the OBD2 generic mode will work just fine. Remember, all of these PCMs have got two rooms in them. They've got an OBD2 room, they've got an enhanced room. And very, very rarely you'll see a situation where you clear a code in the enhanced room and it's still in the OBD2 room even though you fix the car. You've got to go into the OBD2 room and, OBD2 room and clear the code to get rid of the check engine light. So don't be confused by that. All right, pins 4 and 5 always ground, 16 is always power, we've already talked about that. Pins 1, 3, 8, 9, 11, 12, and 13 are open for the manufacturer's use of any other communication they want to use them for. Pin 7 is usually a one-wire bus that communicates with PCMs and other modules, but it can sometimes talk with PCMs as well. 6 and 14 are enhanced OBD bus terminals typically. Now this one right here on 2008 Impala, pin 1 is your GM local area network low speed communications terminal. Scan tool, power ground, high speed, gem land terminal. And so basically 14 is high speed. So you know 14 and 16. Uh, you got the plus and minuses here. So both you usually got a plus and a minus terminal. Scan tool, power, battery, positive voltage terminal. Alright, now we're gonna talk about a problem. This is a little bit of a war story thing here. Pretty cool little story. Come on, you enjoy this stuff. With 2014 Silverado. ABS and brake light on, supplemental and inflatable restraint light on, service tire pressure system. Brake system message is displayed and all of the gauges are in operation. Alright. Seeing problems with several different systems at the same time usually means a communication failure of which modules are which one are talking and which ones aren't. Okay, if you look at all your modules, this particular system that this guy used basically was looking at all the modules and see if you look at the ones that aren't communicating, you can basically track. Are these modules on the same network? Yes, they are. Okay, here's your high speed network. On this particular one, 6 and 14. There's your data link connector. Here's your high speed network. PCM, DCM, human interface control one. What the heck is that? What's a HIM module? Anybody know? Like voice talk huh? Is that where you like talk to the car or something? No, that's where you've got your screen that you touch uh -huh. in the middle of the dash, right? Uh, telecommunications module, which is telematics, I'm sorry. That's your own star and that kind of thing. Um, junction box fuse panel, 
power steering module, APS module, chassis control, terminating resistor. That's important. All right, so right here you got this below speed network is a one wire network that's talking to pin number one. It's right there on your data link and it's right here on your schematic, right? And this right here, these funky things right here, these are pretty cool because those are the combs that GM had. They're little bus bars you can take out so you can check each network separately. In other words, each module on the network can be checked separately if you pull this junction box out. That's pretty smart what they did. Uh, they're not the only ones that did it, but it was smart. Okay? So you notice all the non-communicating modules are using DLC terminal 1, which is the low-speed network, so what codes are set? Now we're looking at, uh, we plug our scan tool in, we're looking at the codes that are set. Have you noticed that all of the codes that are set are basically high-speed, high-speed network, BCM and human interface control? And of course, it's complaining that it can't talk about it. Look at all these things it's lost communication with. See that? All of this other stuff right here is on the low module. The low speed modules have not stored codes, but the high speed modules have. The problem appears to be restricted to the low speed network. All right, so let's parse the codes. Take a look, scope look at the high speed network. We hook our between ground, and each one of these, we find all kinds of activity here. Now, you're not going to be able to look at that scope pattern and tell anything other than the fact that it's talking. A lot of the times it won't talk until you plug a scan tool in and start telling it to talk. So how are you going to hook up to that? Got any idea? No, let's do it a better way. Let's use a breakout box for the data link. If you don't got one of those in your toolbox, you're going to be handicapped. Handy as all get out and plug that in. You got all your pins right here. You can have it talking to your scan tool while you're checking those pins with your scope. See how handy that is? How much does that cost? I don't remember that one there. I got it about, um, heck, five, six, seven years ago. Uh, but you can buy those things every day. You're going to pay usually over $100. A lot of them have got lights on them and all kinds of cool stuff now where you can just plug it in at a glance and see what you got. But I, I would definitely, that one's probably one of the less expensive ones. Uh, it's uh, made by uh, New Dye Corporation. But uh, I bought it from Tooltopia. But you can get one of those. You probably buy one on Amazon. OBD2 breakout box. All right. We're going to scan the high speed network. We find blue skies and green light. See that? Everybody's just fine on the high speed network, and that's the high speed network there. Let's look at the low speed network. We're basically measuring between ground and pin one. There's a little low speed network. It's at a fixed 2.78 volts. And it's just got a little hiccup every now and then, but that thing's not talking. All right, so I like to disconnect the battery when checking resistance so it's not going to confuse the meter with trace voltage. But the resistance between terminal 1 and ground is 365 ohms. I got 360 here, 365 down there. But the thing about it is I'm measuring from here to here. You can pick either one of those. And I'm measuring a whole lot lower resistance there than I'm supposed to. We got some kind of a short one on there. Now there's a joint connector, some guys call it a cold one, what I saw about earlier, where there are seven component network connections. We're going to check each network leg for a short ground, and all are very high resistance readings except for circuit 5060, which reads 121 ohms, and leads to the radio. All right, so we actually took the comb out. There's your comb. There's a picture of it down there. It's hard to see. That, that, our GMC's got one of those, by the way. You can pull a little comb out we got all the network. And uh, so this one right here is basically the comb has been removed, pulled out, and that, that opened this up. And with your meter, you check between ground and each one of these. And with the radio, we busted the radio. The radio is where it was going. Now, right now, just looking at the dash, we see what we look like an OEM radio. But what we have here, behind the radio, there's some kind of a funky aftermarket module wired in. I don't know what the guy was doing there. Then he wired that in, going to try to. Have you ever noticed how people can't typically leave one alone? They feel like they got to make it special, like theirs is a little different from everybody else's, you know? And sometimes they get in trouble on that. Anyway, that circuit was shorted to ground, one of the radio, 5060, enough to, where the, to take down the low speed bus. And with this module removed, and everything hooked up like it's supposed to be, we had all kinds of activity on the low speed bus. All right, so. Wrap your head around the bus. Study it on a vehicle in question. Separate the buses and determine which module is where. 
network diagnostics can be a really wild adventure. And rather than dealing with a lot of modules and wires, you're just dealing with one or two wires and groups of modules. All right. Now, I know you guys learned something you didn't know when you came in here. Did I do Marcus Park to bed? Huh? You understand? Well, you understand the networks better than you did. I mean, it's not quite as complicated as it seems like it would be. It sounds really scary when you're working on it. But uh, we, there's entire classes up there at uh, Kansas City, at KC Vision, where I go every year, on nothing but network diagnostics. That's, that's all it is. And uh, so, and the, the, everybody is kind of wanting to understand how that works and all. But if you put, if you can find out what's on which network and which modules aren't talking, you can usually figure it out. You know, if you got one module that's not talking, you're going to see if you got a broke wire going in between it and the, you know, like that. This one guy brought his, uh, years ago when I was at the Ford dealership, I plugged into his data link connector and couldn't get my scan tool to come up because on the OBD2, the connector is supposed to bring your scan tool up to provide voltage. And uh, when I did that, it wouldn't work. So I got under the dash and this guy had taken the wires and went to his scan tool connector and went click and just cut him and he wired his radio up using pins 16 and 4. <laughs> he didn't know what it was for. He just saw a connector wasn't plugged in anything. He said, well, I don't need this thing. There's nothing plugs in here. So he just cut the wire and went to it. So anyway.